Mac, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come talk to these amazing care blazers. And can you just take a moment to introduce yourself, share a little bit about your background and what the Milken Institute is? Definitely. And I just have to start off again. Thank you so much for having me. This is such an awesome channel and it's really my privilege to be here. So thank you again. I just have to start with that. But, you know, I live in Washington, D.C. right now. I'm at home in my um, home office. And I started my career right after college working in managed care. I was at Anthem, which is now Elevance Health, working in its cost of care and population health arm of the company. And I think that's really where my interest in public health and older adults came to be and really started for me. In my two and a half years there, I became really well-versed in population health trends among Medicare and Medicaid covered beneficiaries, as well as dual eligibles. And from there in that experience, I just became knowledgeable about how overlapping so many risk factors are for the most prevalent chronic diseases in the U.S. and how it always seems like the same communities, the same underserved communities are the most at risk for all of the above. And so after my stint there, I decided I wanted to move into something a little bit more mission driven, something I was really proud of and felt like was more of a reflection of really my passion. So I applied to grad school and I moved to the Milken Institute and in it was November 2020, so quite the time in the United States during COVID, so I started virtually, but I'm a senior associate on our team, and I'm really excited about all the work that we have going on. I'm excited to be able to share it with you today, and I actually just finished my master's in public health this month, so I'm in a good space. Just excited to talk about most pressing issue, really, which is dementia right now. I think a hot topic, too. Right. Well, first, congratulations on your master's degree. That's an amazing accomplishment. Thank and you so much. the way that I came to know you was I found this report from the Milken Institute, the Center for the Future on Aging. Right. And it was all about dementia care navigation. And I, I want to talk about this, but first I want to just explain, can you explain what is the Milken Institute and the future of aging? What do you guys do in there? Absolutely. So the Milken Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank focused on facilitating and accelerating progress for really people to live more meaningful lives and building the financial, physical, and mental mental and environmental health capital for people to be able to do that. We have headquarters in Washington, D.C., where I am, as well as Santa Monica. And our whole kind of approach in doing the mission that I was just talking about is convening expert leaders, ideas, and innovative resourcing to develop like blueprints for tackling the most critical global issues in finance and health and philanthropy. Within the Milken Institute, the Center for the Future of Aging is housed within the health pillar of the Milken Institute, or MI Health for short, and we're a team of seven people really dedicated to improving healthy longevity and financial security for all people through high-impact policies, research convenings, and multi-sector partners. And we operate under the idea, the proven idea that healthy longevity and financial security are inextricably linked and inseparable for health across the life course. And so we're extremely passionate about raising awareness and implementing innovative programs and policies that really seek to address just how paramount this incredible demographic shift that we're seeing globally and in the United States really is in the accompanying aging related chronic conditions that will come with it. So, I mean, I'm sure this statistic is so familiar to your viewership too, but one in for adults is projected to be at least age 65 by 2050. And obviously the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias is just projected to grow exorbitantly, I think 13 million people by 2030. So how do we address that? And like, why why do we work in this space to begin with? In 2020, an expert named Nora Super, who was our previous executive director of the Alliance to Improve Dementia Care, had this vision to help transform and improve the health and long-term care systems for people living with dementia and their caregivers. And so my work, once I came to the Milken Institute, really started focusing on co-leading our alliance. And it's grown exponentially in the three years that we've been alive. We marched in July 2020, and it's just a huge passion project for everybody involved. Yes, I love it. And you are an unusual guest for the channel. And I love that you're here because most of the people that we have on the channel are either first line caregivers, whether they're, you know, a healthcare provider or an actual family member. And what I love about you coming on here and what I want all Careblazers to see is that there are hidden heroes, hidden people behind the scenes that are helping make big change in the dementia caregiving world in particular. And that's what I see you guys doing specifically when it comes to this whole dementia care navigation, because that's how I first learned about you. And I thought the timing was so perfect because I 
had read this report that, you know, we can get into and talk about, about this, the importance of having dementia care navigation and growing the workforce. And I'm like, this is so amazing. Care Blazers, I'll make sure to link it below the video too. It's free for anybody to access. And so I reached out. And then the first time we met and talked, you know, the information on the guide model had just come out and come to find out you guys were a big piece of making that happen. So can we just first stop and talk about what is a dementia care navigator? How can they help dementia caregivers? Like basically the whole background of your report. And then we'll get into what this whole guide model is, which is very exciting. Definitely. I'd love to. And, and thanks so much for that cue. That's so, uh, it's it's nice to hear. It's like encouraging. So we well, taking a, a super brief step back and then I'll jump right into the report. So our Alliance to Improve Dementia Care convenes over 120 dementia experts across government, health systems, research, philanthropy, industry, advocacy, community-based organizations, and last but not least, people with lived experience, people with dementia and caregivers. And so I see say that because when we embarked on producing the report that you just mentioned, Guiding the Care Journey, Building Dementia Workforce and System Capacity Through Care Navigation, we approached it in the year and it's making really in the, in the same way that we that we generally approach all of our work products, which was at the beginning of 2022, interviewing over 40 key opinion leaders and experts across the field in those stakeholder groups I just mentioned, doing our own research, convening a roundtable in September 2022, and then releasing the report this past March. And the reason I say that is because when we first set off on the project, we were trying to answer the big question of what is the biggest gap in workforce capacity? And the more and more people that we talked to, the biggest theme that emerged was the need for this care coordinator, this care navigator, whatever we were calling it, dementia care specialist, brain health specialist, care coordinator. And so we thought, hmm, well, this is a little bit different. This is a little bit more focused than the way that we've generally built reports prior. Let's hone in on this. And when we hosted our private roundtable, we sought to really answer the question of how can we elevate this role and and improve payment mechanisms to scale it across care teams in the United States. And so a care navigator, as we define it, is that link between the medical services and social services that are integral to quality of life for people living with dementia, as well as their caregivers. They can serve in a variety of roles as a nurse practitioner, as a social worker, as somebody unlicensed, physician associate, et cetera, at varying capacities in different settings of care, as well as different professional capacities, and really be that guide that I think people living with dementia and their caregivers need so desperately upon receiving a diagnosis, probably one of the most daunting experiences I think someone can have. And so they kind of serve as that bridge between all of the required elements of what it means to be comprehensive, high quality care. There's a number of models and experts that we currently work with as part of the Alliance that have demonstrated care navigation pretty effectively, one of which is the Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program in UCLA, led by a guy named David Rubin, who's an amazing expert, geriatrician. Their care navigation services are delivered by nurse practitioners who serve in a dementia care specialist role, who also have dementia care assistants as part of their team who are unlicensed. At the University of California, San Francisco, they have a care team navigator who's unlicensed who delivers care triage, education telephonically. So it's so also a way of... Go ahead. Can, can you explain like what would be something that they are doing specifically that would help the caregiver? Like just so the care blazers really understand how important yeah. these people are. Yeah, absolutely. So in some models, a care navigator or whatever the model would be calling it would be the point person, the point of main point of contact for an interprofessional care team for disease education, for care triage, the person who picks up at the end of the hotline or the 24 seven helpline, scheduling assistance for appointments, navigating to the right specialists, patient caregiver diets, support and education, also informational counseling and connecting to supportive services and respite. It addresses both. I think that's a great thing about the role too, is it addresses them, the person with dementia and their caregiver as a dyad, understanding how linked they are in delivering care. Yeah. I love that. It's like pointing them to things that can help, resources that can help, helping them yeah. just navigate what is often a very complicated system. So I think that's wonderful. And then talk about what this guide model is. I mean, this is pretty much hot off the press. I mean, by the time this releases on YouTube, it'll be like a couple of months old, but this right. is pretty exciting what, what is about to come. Can you share a little bit about what that is? Definitely. It's incredibly exciting. 
thing I agree. Our alliance was thrilled when the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Innovation Center announced this past July, the Guiding and Improved Dementia Experience or GUIDE model. The announcement actually came earlier than we were expecting. We briefed them on our report this past March when it was released. We actually were anticipating an announcement in the fall. So it was a pleasant surprise. I mean, also more pleasant about a big win for us that we felt was the inclusion of a specific care navigator as a distinct role within the model to do those things that I was just talking about, to serve is that point of contact, facilitate care coordination, link to the right services, handle care crises, answer questions, education, et cetera. And I think it's a huge win for value-based care and delivering comprehensive care to more people in the U.S. And the ultimate goals of the model are to improve quality of life, not only for the person diagnosed with dementia, but also their caregiver, reduce the burden and strain on paid caregivers. For the first time, providing payment to healthcare providers who link caregivers to respite services that will actually be paid for through the model and adult day services are also at home support. And another goal is just preventing or delaying the placement in facilities like nursing homes to keep people at home as long as possible. So it's really aimed at providing comprehensive person-centered and longitudinal care, just addressing all of those aspects that are, I think, really complex, but really unique to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of clinics out there. You mentioned several that are doing this stuff already in a really great way, but given this new guide model coming down and the funding that's going behind it, we should start to see it more and more. Like people will have more access to a dementia care navigator and be able to get that help. Whereas right now, I think the majority of people would be like, what is that? What's, you know, I don't have access to that. I've never even heard of that word before. So. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, there's a lot of innovation that goes on at academic medical centers. Unfortunately, too much of the innovation and comprehensive dementia care is going on there now. And that's often out of reach for a lot of people underserved communities, rural communities. And so what's great and what's really encouraging, I think, about the guide model is that CMS specifically targeted it to improve care for underserved communities, rural communities, people of color, and has specific health equity aspects of it to improve care really for everybody. I mean, we know the disproportionate risk for dementia among Black, Hispanic, Asian American communities. And so it's it's encouraging, I think, that policy is really starting to catch up with what caregivers, for example, um, and experts in the field have known for years now, uh, just about the intricacies of dementia care. Right. Do you have any idea when we would start seeing this rolling out? Yeah. I mean, the, one of the, actually, I thought really interesting things about the way that they launched um, or announced the launch of, of the model is that it'll be delivered in kind of a phased approach. So starting July 1st, 2024 will be the first rollout among healthcare providers that are already equipped and trained and ready to, to deliver the guide model. For those that are not yet ready, but would like to deliver the model, they'll have a year of ramp up to train their staff, hire staff, develop the competencies necessary to then launch the following year in 2025. So I think that was a great way too of allowing everybody to participate, even if they couldn't get it going by this coming year. I think they're really trying to scale this as much as possible and just make sure that as many people with dementia, diagnosed dementia and their caregivers can get this comprehensive care. Yeah, I love it. It's definitely a move in the right direction, it feels like. Again, a lot of it comes from the Milken Institute, your the health group specifically, the experts you have convened, like Careblazers, there are people we don't even see or hear about gathering together to put their brains together to figure out what can they do to make this world more dementia friendly, give more caregiver support. And we don't see a lot of that. And a lot of times it takes years and years for anything to really come to fruition. And like, we're right now on the cusp of starting to see a lot of it. So it's super exciting. I was just going to add to your point too. Absolutely. And I also think something that I think sets the alliance apart and also sets my team apart at the Milken Institute is actually all of us on the team have some form of lived experience. Either I have not been a caregiver, but members of my team have. Members of my team have lost um, loved ones to Alzheimer's disease. My grandma has Alzheimer's disease. And so I think like your audience, we share a lot of that lived experience and upfront knowledge of the condition. But I mean, we really have made it like our life's work to move the needle for people that know how just how hard it is to care for someone across the disease course. Yeah. And I love it. And the fact that you include actual caregivers and people living with dementia is important. That's a part that's missed a lot when people try to help. It's like, well, they're not talking to the people going through it. So I love that those are included as experts in your group as well. Yeah. Me too. That's it's one of our favorite parts. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine. Okay. So when we first met, you were talking about the importance of destigmatizing dementia. 
Yes. Can you talk about this? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, I think in my work thus far, so I I love public health. That was that's what my passion is. I just finished school for public health and I try to incorporate, you know, aspects of public health practice into our work as much as possible. And I became increasingly interested throughout my time at the Milken Institute working on our Alliance to Improve Dementia Care about that prevention piece. And so even dovetailing from my work at Elevance years ago, it's just really interesting to me how, especially, you know, growing proportion of older adults, aging related conditions like dementia, we don't talk about the most prevalent chronic conditions, I think, together as much as we should. I think we often approach chronic diseases in silos. And I think one of the other incredibly unique things about dementia too, is that a lot of the same risk factors for heart disease, diabetes, stroke, obesity, hypertension overlap with dementia. And those diseases that I just mentioned are actually themselves vascular risk factors for dementia. And so there's kind of this double whammy of what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And that's become a very big passion of mine. And actually one of our sponsors, AARP, they have a global council on brain health and they have six pillars of brain health that they promote. And I was just going to mention them. They're um, staying socially engaged, staying intellectually engaged, managing stress, physical activity, restorative sleep, and eating healthy. And so even as a young person, getting more educated about, you know, the impact of those modifiable risk factors on my brain health motivates me even more to be health, as healthy as I can. And so I think also it underscores the fact that unfortunately, you know, the leading chronic conditions disproportionately impact the same communities that face the biggest social determinants to health, the biggest kind of socio-environmental burdens that impact their life course and their ability to remain healthy as they age. So I think also by broadening the conversation, we destigmatize cognitive health, especially in relation to physical health. And my hope one day is that people approach memory screening just the way they would getting their blood pressure checked. I think that would just be incredibly important for older adults. Absolutely. What do you think are the steps to start making that happen and go in the right direction? What do we need to do to, this is just like another vital we check technically. Yeah. I honestly think, and I hope, I mean, I hope this doesn't sound like a fun answer, but I think it's just starting to talk about it and, and raising awareness for folks that might not be familiar about the risk factors for dementia. I think a lot of people, for example, and my family or my friends might not know that a lot of the steps to prevent obesity might also be protecting your brain. It's funny you ask that because I'm, I'm actually putting together a panel for this year's Milken Institute Future of Health Summit. It's a platform event that we host every winter time exactly on this topic by reducing silos and chronic disease prevention to promote whole health. And I think more people than not don't realize that, you know, going on a run or eating healthy or getting great sleep will also help their brain and maybe placebo effect. But I went on a run yesterday morning. I felt like my day was better because of it. So yeah, yeah I think it's just about normalizing those conversations and not stigmatizing cognitive decline. I think, unfortunately, I mean, especially among underserved and communities of color, but really all communities, there is still, I think, this kind of hush hush mentality about cognitive health. And it's not fair. I think it really isolates people that might have a diagnosis or fear of diagnosis. Yes. That fear of diagnosis is real, especially for a lot of my care blazers who say like, I mean, they might be caring for a parent. They're like, this runs in my family and I'm really afraid to get it. And it's like, there are things you can do to reduce your risk. Like in many ways, that's very hopeful in terms of, okay, what can I start doing to reduce my own risk? But then there's the side of caregiving, which makes it sometimes hard to do with maybe not being able to get as much sleep because you're up at night caring for a loved one wandering away. Like those are really real things. But I think yeah. you're right. The more we talk about it and address it, the more important it is. So there's like the side of like, what are modifiable risk factors? Like these are real to lower your risk. And then for the people who do already have dementia, how are we talking about this? Like this is heart disease, obesity, right. any other medical condition that we're talking about all day, every day, but yet dementia feels like something that is a little bit more hush hush. And it's still something that has so much confusion around it. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned caregivers too, because I mean, I know that your audience knows this and lived experience, but I mean, caregivers of a person living with dementia probably any chronic disease, chronic disease have their own health risks associated with that mental and physical. And so I think that's something that I'm so happy about with the guide model announcement is just policy catching up to realizing that caregivers are an essential part of the care team. And it's a, really a distinct but related recipient of that care too. Yeah, I always say, you know, we always hear these 
things about making this a more dementia friendly world. And I always say it's impossible to be a dementia friendly world if we're not being a caregiver friendly world, because the yeah. brunt of the care is on that family member providing all this care. So I love too that this guide model and everything the Milken Institute has done is like the importance of the dyad. You can't just treat the person with dementia and ignore the caregiver doing everything. Like it, it is a team, like a pair. We have to address both of them. Absolutely. Yeah. So we also talked about when we first met, like for you, it was really important to talk about how do we champion caregivers? Talk about what that means. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think even piggybacking off what we were just talking about, it's, it's such an essential foundation of our alliance to champion not only people living with dementia, but also their caregivers as distinct recipients of care, but also interconnected. And so generally with every convening that we have, every report that we write, we try to include that lived experience perspective as much as possible. And we're very grateful and lucky to have a lot of partner organizations as, as part of our alliance that have their own resources for caregivers. And I mean, probably many of which your audience is super familiar with, but we do a lot of work with the Health Resources and Services Administration, Us Against Alzheimer's, the Benjamin Road Institute on Aging, ARP, obviously, and the Alzheimer's Association. I mean, all of these organizations are just such incredible experts. I mean, they've been doing this for such a long time and they've developed such, in my opinion, cutting edge and really thorough um, caregiver support documents, helplines, FAQs, videos. And so I think kind of in a way that complements the role of whatever a care navigator is, whether it's one person or a concept more ethereally, I think there's ways that we can also improve caregiver outreach through technology, you know, apps. And there's a lot, I think, at their disposal online that I hope just becomes a little bit more widespread. I mean, even someone that I used to work with, her father had a dementia diagnosis and she goes, I got the diagnosis and I had just zero idea where to turn. And I hope that that's not the norm as soon as possible, obviously. So we're just really proud basically to partner with a bunch of organizations that are championing caregivers just as much as anyone else. I think there's also a lot of really interesting startups in the field like Ripple Care, Synaptica, Eva Health, Care Brains. I'm just listing them off the top of my head, but are really doing some cool stuff to integrate their experience and make their usability front and center. Yeah. And Careblazers, I'll make sure to link to as many of them as I can in the description below so you can check them out. But I could see one of the roles of a dementia care navigator could be to help point them into some of these directions. And yeah. also like there is a concern. There's great people doing great things, great organizations doing great things. But then also there's a, all kinds of stuff on the internet. Like how do you know where to turn? How do you know what to trust? How do you know what's actually good? And I think that's a component that's becoming more and more tricky as more and more people turn online and more and more people realize this is an aging population that's looking for answers. And so we, we have to kind of be careful. I completely agree. And I was, I love that you just said that because I was thinking, you know, in my head, a lot of caregivers, for example, would want to experience information a lot differently. I mean, some might like a lot of online resources. I think you in particular with this channel are, have such an interesting and important kind of like position in this space. And others might want to rely most on community-based organizations or their healthcare providers for information. And so I think, you know, hopefully with the rollout of guide and just general awareness growing about person-centered care, that can also be a part of the conversation in developing a care plan for someone with dementia and their caregiver how do you want to get your information? What is your preferred source of education? Like, where would you want to build your skills? I think that's going to be key because you're right. I mean, there's so many resources across the internet and really everywhere now, which is fantastic, but I think it can also be really overwhelming and daunting too. Yeah. I love that though. Talking to them, keeping in mind with the person-centered approach, how do you like to get your information? What do you feel most comfortable with? How do you learn the best? Like that's really important. I know we're coming up at the end of our time, but I'd love to just, you already listed some, so maybe that's it, but I want to just make sure at the very end, resources for caregivers that you know, based on people you are involved with in the Institute that you think would be great for caregivers looking for additional resources. Absolutely. I mentioned before that we work um, with experts from the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. They have a really interesting family care navigator tool on its website that does a lot of what we were talking about before. It helps caregivers find state-specific resources on legal issues, even government health and disability benefits, living arrangements, and services and education for caregivers. And they have a whole dementia curriculum that caregivers can access as well. You UCLA houses several dementia caregiver training videos in multiple different languages, English, Spanish, French, Korean, Vietnamese, Hungarian, and even Macedonian, which is incredible. And then we have some 
awesome friends and colleagues at Us Against Alzheimer's who host the Brain Health Academy, which has very strong prevention focus. And they have webinars that occur, I think, either monthly or bi-monthly. And ARP, uh, something that I find particularly cool, is has its own Staying Sharp, which is a digital program with information on brain health. And that can be used by someone living with dementia in conjunction with their caregiver. And then, of course, the Alzheimer's Association's 24-7 hotline, which is you know, available in multiple languages as well. Anything you want to add before we end here, Mac? No, I mean, I think I would say just, again, thank you so much for having me. I know I'm kind of a unique type of guest that you would have on here. But what I would say is that I promise all of your viewership, there are obviously people in this field that are working actively and super hard and recognize, you know, all of the experiences that go along with being a dementia caregiver. You know, I continue to press forward with our Alliance to Improve Dementia Care. And just, I hope that people after like a really fun July in terms of news and dementia and Alzheimer's disease with the DMTs and the guide model. And just, I think we're making a lot of really good progress in the field, progress that I'm hoping really continues into the next year. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I just, everyone press on and keep working because I think it's really making a difference. I think policymakers are really starting to see just how imperative this effort is. Yeah, I love it. And again, thank you so much. You guys are so behind the scenes in terms of like what most caregivers see, yet you're so influential and helpful. And the reason, a large reason why next year in the summer, hopefully we'll start to see more and more resources available to caregivers. So, so appreciate you, appreciate everything that the Milken Institute is doing. Thank you so much for taking the time to come talk to all the Care Blazers. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Care Blazers. And um, I can't wait to keep watching your videos. Thanks so much. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Matt. Also, Nico gets a belly rub for every person who subscribes from this video. So if you haven't already, click the red subscribe button. It's totally free. And Nico says, thank you very much.